Welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, being the, here. Uh, I see some familiar names in the audience. Uh, dear Karina Car Kerrigan from the Kabadi Asset Museum, hi. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I would like to thank you for all being with us uh, today and contributing to this discussion in this most struggling times. And in behalf of the AMC, I'd, like, I'd also like to thank a special thank to you all um, museum workers that are inside taking care of our institutions and collections, security people, maintenance people, conservators, and all the staff that are keeping museums active and meaningful in these times. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, welcome speakers um, that are uh, today with us. Lindsay Cook, visiting assistant professor of art at Foster, at Foster College and uh, Corinne Wagner, uh, director of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. And I would also uh, like to clarify that maybe we'll be having uh, another guest coming and joining us late because uh, of an emergency in his institution, Dr. Alexander Kellner of the Museum, uh, National Museum in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. I'd also like to uh, clarify that Dr. Freda Nick Nikki Rote, Migno, Migno, oh, sorry, Mig, Migumbury, sorry, uh, County Di Director of the British Institute in Eastern Africa, could not join us today as announced uh, due to technical issues that prevent her from uh, uh, online access uh, to this meeting. Um, if you would like to know more about our guests, I, uh, well, uh, I encourage you to check uh, AMC's website and uh, for their full um, biographies. And thank you for, again, for being with us today. Um, also, uh, I would like to, to say a few words about this um, webinar. And I know um, this is uh, most, you know, um, uh, urgent matter uh, that we are dealing now uh, with the pandemic. Uh, this uh, debate that we are doing today might get, uh, you know, uh, very uh, timely. And I hope uh, your uh, questions and uh, contributions to this debate also uh, make us address uh, our current situation. This uh, webinar was designed to address issues of uh, disaster response uh, in different kind of institutions and uh, projects. And uh, we were prompt to respond to events like uh, we had in the museum, uh, National Museum of Rio de Janeiro or with the Notre Dame uh, Cathedral uh, recently that uh, have uh, given rise to concerns on necessity of international support and networks to prepare for and to respond uh, to such high uh, proportion disasters. Um, we uh, have done before a discussion last July uh, on uh, that uh, touched some of those issues. Uh, and this webinar will especially focus on international case studies to further share concepts and lessons learned in applying best practices uh, to the subject. And so uh, we will be discussing methods, protocols, and resources uh, to our organizations to, um, you know, um, act before, during, and in the aftermath of uh, this kind of situation. So uh, uh, I would like to um, clarify, we'll be uh, having our guests speak for about 15 to 20 minutes each. And then we'll have time for uh, questions to the panelists and questions among uh, the participants. So uh, again, thank you very much for joining us and uh, I hope we have a great discussion. So uh, could uh, Corinne begin maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Corey Wegner from the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. And I think I know a few people here and there that have signed up for the webinar after looking at the guest list. So um, hello to everybody. Um, so 
basically, we in um, thinking about the case studies, um, and because my colleagues had um, examples of the um, Brazil National Museum and Notre Dame, what I thought I would do is pick a case study that we've worked on with the Smithsonian involving a museum uh, impacted by armed conflict. Um, but first I'll tell you just a little bit about the Cultural Rescue Initiative. We started in 2010 really with the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project. And at the time um, I was working still as a curator at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And, um, but I was the president of the US Committee of the Blue Shield, which is an organization nonprofit dedicated to promoting the 1954 Hague Convention to protect cultural heritage and armed conflict. And um, working uh, after the Haiti earthquake, we were, we tried to put together um, an alliance of organizations that could probably try to help Haiti's heritage along with US government agencies that might be working in that area. And that's how I started working with the Smithsonian. And in 2012, it was, you know, after an 18 month project working there, trying to save um, thousands of collections objects, we decided that we needed to be able to do this better and faster in other places around the world. Because while there are a lot of projects and programs for long range recovery for cultural heritage, there are not very many programs that deal with the actual cultural rescue um, in the, in a, at a focus point in time. So um, since 2012, I've been at the Smithsonian working to gather our programming on cultural heritage impacted by disaster situations. And our areas that we work are awareness raising, training, research, and response. And so today I'm gonna to focus on response in the case of the Mosul Museum. So as I'm sure most of you have heard, um, the, the Mosul Museum suffered a devastating uh, damage by ISIS in the period of occupation of Mosul, and I'll talk about that in a second. But at, well, first of all, I wanna address how um, disaster response in an armed conflict situation can be similar to disaster response in all types of hazard situations from flooding to fire to um, just normal um, issues of an earthquake. I mean, I know that's not normal, but a lot of people see them as very, very different situations from conflict, but in many ways they're not because basically you're still going to need to document, assess damage, salvage, stabilize, and rehouse collections to prepare for early recovery. So, um, the, but the one place that there really is a difference is um, when you're dealing with first responders, your first responders, and, and it could be the case in some countries where it might be the military, but in armed conflict situations, you're most certainly gonna be working with the military in some way and armed non-state actors as well. So um, the, the other issue is that in armed conflicts and other situations where criminal activity is known or suspected, you may have the added responsibility of gathering evidence for the potential criminal prosecution of the perpetrators, including possible war crimes tribunals. And so that's an added layer of responsibility on those who are helping to do the disaster response for a cultural institution. Muslim Museum Project Zero is a collaborative effort between the Smithsonian Institution, the Louvre Museum, the Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas, which is known as ALIF, based in Geneva, and with the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and the Mosul Museum itself to assess the status of the museum after its liberation from ISIS or Daesh. Um, there's two buildings on the compound there in Mosul. One um, is an older building which opened in 1952. It's kind of a small, smaller neoclassical building. And then they added a second larger building in 1974. And it's the, together, it's, and that was a purpose-built building. And so together they really formed the largest museum in Iraq after the Iraq National Museum in Baghdad. Um, it was uh, traditionally they've had four collecting areas in that museum, a prehistoric collection, a neo-Assyrian collection, which is largely from excavated objects from the archaeological site at Nimrud, which is outside Mosul, which was also destroyed by Daesh, not completely destroyed, but heavily damaged by Daesh. Um, 
it also has a collection from the archaeological site of Hatra and an Islamic collection largely from the Mosul local area. Um, there were there was a gallery dedicated to each area, plus a pretty extensive library of more than 20,000 volumes. Um, in 2014, Daesh ISIS attacked Mosul and occupied the city along with much of Nineveh province in northern Iraq. On February 26, 2015, Daesh released a video of the destruction on social media sites inside the museum. In the video, most of the collections destroyed appeared to be in the Assyrian and Hatra galleries. And just for the record, um, there was a lot of discussion at the time about these being fakes. They were not fakes. For the most part, the objects um, destroyed were original, um, genuine objects. Uh, luckily, back in 2003, before the US invasion of Iraq, most of the movable collections in the museum had been um, evacuated to Baghdad, unfortunately, just in time for the looting of the National Museum in Baghdad. However, luckily, the crates from the Mosul Museum appeared to be unharmed in that, um, in that looting event. So, um, Dash continued to occupy the museum during which time the staff were not allowed to enter. They basically used it as an administrative site um, to do all kinds of weird stuff from everything from making photocopies of flyers to um, they, they kept a lot of records there, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the damage occurred some, uh, continued to occur between October 2016 and July 2017 um, and during the coalition-led offensive to take the city back from ISIS. Its position in the old city of Western Mosul placed it on the front lines where it sustained more damage from mortar rounds and small arms fire um, the, from the, for the battle for Mosul. Um, as, as Daesh was pushed out, they also set fire to the museum library, destroying the 20,000 volume collection pretty much entirely. And they also set fire to the interior of the smaller original building, which was used for administrative offices for the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage. After the liberation of Mosul from Daesh in July 2017, staff from the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage gradually regained access to the museum and were able to carry out very initial damage assessment and basic emergency stabilization. And here's what they found. And um, if you could go ahead and put up the first slide. So this is kind of a sad before and after of the Neo-Assyrian gallery with the objects that are mostly from Nimrud. And you can see that um, they used a lot of explosives inside the building. In addition to the hammers and things that you saw in the videos, they used um, high explosives in this area. And that piece, the, um, the object in the center of the floor is a throne dais from Nimrud. And they basically packed underneath of it with explosives and blew it so up so much that they created this huge hole in the floor. And it's difficult um, to, to get scale from this picture, but other pictures didn't have quite the same view that I wanted to show you, but that, that hole in the floor is approximately the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. It's quite about eight meters across. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, and then this is the before and after of the library. And so um, the, the setting, they had a lot of fuel with the books and everything, and they were pretty much completely destroyed. It was very difficult to tell if, if things were stolen from the library because what remains is so, um, is so little. Okay, that's, that's all I wanted to show. Um, so the, the problem was is that still, and as you probably saw on the news, even after the quote unquote liberation by the coalition forces, there's still a lot of hangers on from ISIS and by, from Daesh and um, still lots of um, insecurity in the city. And so they weren't really able to do, bring in a team to do a thorough documentation and um, salvage for the collection until even in 2018. And that's when we created this coalition of groups. I should say that the Smithsonian has been working in Iraq for quite a long time. Um, Jessica Johnson, who heads the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute, has worked 
uh, with a number of partners, University of Delaware, Department of State, on training for conservation and collections management and archaeological site management at the Iraqi Institute in Erbil, Iraq, for many years, for like for about 10 years. And so um, the Smithsonian has been working with a lot of Iraqis over the course of time. So we had these really good contacts that we um, maintained over the years. And many of us teach at the Institute each year. So um, after that decision was made to, to create this collaboration and to work with the government, we met in October 2018 to um, plan the recovery, the full response and recovery operation. But we knew we needed to start even before we could do any kind of salvage with um, documentation for this idea that there, this is a war crime and we needed to document it and not just rush in and start picking things up. So we created Mosul Museum Project Zero. And in the project, we the, that early phase, phase zero, basically, we needed to prevent further damage and to salvage objects. We fixed the holes in the roof, and we provided money for our Iraqi colleagues to hire local contractors to do this work. They put plexiglass over all of the broken windows. They were able to um, improve security, better doors, locks throughout the building. They documented damage um, in a thorough way so that um, that we could see what we needed to plan for. Um, and then we knew that we would need to determine um, to do that further documentation and figure out if the building could be repaired or renovated, which is what the Iraqi government wanted to do, if possible, and to um, then plan the salvage and later conservation. So um, we took an expert team to Mosul in February of 2019, including staff um, from the Smithsonian Smithsonian's Conservation Institute, the Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Design, and Culture, a professional photographer, structural engineers from a Czech firm that's familiar with working in Iraq, and all of us had long experience working in Iraq. Um, still, we did a lot of extra preparation for the mission. We commissioned a private security company that we work with to do a risk analysis for the travel from Erbil to Mosul. We all were certified in hazardous environment and advanced first aid training. Um, we had letters of permission from the Iraqi Ministry of Culture and visas to travel across the line from, um, from Kurdistan to, um, to Nineveh province. And we also re received training from the FBI's art crime team and evidence collection team. Um, we learned how to do crime scene photography. That's why we had the professional photographer, crime scene sketching, and evidence collection. Again, we worked closely with Iraqi colleagues, including Zaid Ghazi, who's the director of the museum, and we met with them in advance. We went days in advance. We planned out the trip very carefully because the security company let us know that at that period, they thought we should not spend more than six hours on the ground in the museum at a time and that we should space those times out. So we figured out that we could do it in about two days if we really, really knew precisely what we were doing. We used floor plans, we had meetings with the staff, we agreed on all kinds of things in advance so that we could go in and hit the ground running. Um, it, was, it was a bit like a ballet, in fact, because the photos, the rules of evidence, they don't want people in those photos, et cetera, et cetera. So you had, we had to move really quickly through the building. Um, so I can tell you in kind of in, in conclusion that um, the engineering assessment determined that the Mosul Museum can in fact be repaired despite the heavy structural damage caused by the explosions in the floor and the fire in the basement. The fire did not burn so hot as to um, endanger the concrete, so that was that was really good. Um, the, the we took more than four thousand five hundred photos to document the damage in the building and to document the evidence of what may have caused the explosions, etc. That we found, we found rocket propelled grenades inside, etc. There was some unexploded ordnance. They've since um, done away with that, um, and. The, so we're really excited about the possibilities. Also, the staff using the methodology that we always teach for disaster response in every situation, they're able to carefully number all the objects and um, store them in a secure way and to also 
further fix the building envelope so that it's not leaking from the, um, from the munitions holes and things like that. The Louvre colleagues, uh, we, we visited once more in August, and then our Louvre colleagues have also visited to consult on um, more advanced conservation for the, for the fragments that remain. Um, unfortunately, the conflict between the US and Iran, which I um, sillily sometimes call the recent unpleasantness, um, and the resulting shelling in Erbil and in Baghdad have prevented further visits. And then on top of that, the COVID-19 issue. So, um, but I will say that the fact that we had that window of opportunity and we used it wisely means that even though the staff can't be at the building right now, they've carefully stabilized everything and carefully stored the collections in such a way that we all feel much more confident that it's safe and secure in this time of uncertainty. Um, so that's kind of a lesson for all of us today. Um, and I think I'll um, stop there with the case study, but I think there are a number of lessons here for the current situation that we're in, in that um, we always have to ask ourselves when we're doing emergency and disaster planning for cultural institutions, okay, what could go wrong? And if something goes wrong, what more could go wrong? And the answer is quite a lot, actually. Um, so the, the lesson there is, here's the Mosul Museum in a, um, they were in a delayed disaster response, right? The damage to their museum happened more than almost two years until they could actually do the response due to combat situations out of their control. And then they had a window of opportunity. Luckily, they used it wisely and we, we got in there. Um, and now they're overlaid by yet another disaster. Sometimes they come in waves. And so that's a lesson we can learn. It can really interrupt your long-term recovery. Um, and then this disaster is causing economic harm to a lot of museums that we're feeling uh, really painfully right now. Oh, and I should have said my, my co-speakers on the panel are also experiencing that, like the recovery for the Brazil National Museum and for um, Notre Dame is being interrupted by this other large scale disaster that's taking place and it can really slow that recovery. And then you can also be harmed by this disaster. And don't forget, it's spring flooding time, tornadoes, hurricane season will start, it starts earlier every year, I think. And it doesn't, just because we're going through this disaster, it does not mean that we can't be further harmed by an additional disaster. So thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Corinne. Um, I, I'd like to ask Lindsay to, to join uh, the, the conversation. And, uh, Are you oh, sure Dr. Kellner shouldn't go first? I was just thinking sort right, of chronologically. Okay. Let, let's, let, let's do it, let's okay. do it. Uh, so Dr. Kellner uh, finally uh, could join us. Thank you for, for being here. And um, so I, I ask you to, to introduce yourself a little bit more and, and jump in in the conversation. Thank you. You have to, to turn on your speaker. Well, thank you for telling me that, Fernando. And by the way, thank all of you. And I would like to apologize for my delay, but I had an Ulrich meeting that uh, uh, went on actually quite well. So my name is Alexander Kellner. I'm the director and the present director of the Museo Nacional. And I guess all of you have heard about the, the big tragedy that has happened uh, um, last year, actually on September 2nd. Uh, what, what I can tell you, and, and, and my, my approach will be that one is never prepared for something like that. I mean, we, I, I was on the job uh, on a, le a little bit less than seven months. We were planning with, with a lot of renewal of the museums. We just got something we were aiming for and that was a big founding. I mean, for us, big founding. It's roughly around uh, five, six million dollars from the BNDS, which is a bank, which is a development bank in Brazil. So we finally got that. It was signed on uh, June 5th one day before the museum completed 200 years of existence. So there was a lot of hopes on that. And 
uh, a lot of projects going on, and then on September 2nd uh, happened what, what happened. And, and what I can tell you is, perhaps the most important aspect after the fire was not the, the work that was done by ourselves, by, 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 by the people from the museum, but the most important aspect was the international work. This is, I can, I can make this, this I, re, I really, I think this, this might be, become even a case study in the future. But when UNESCO arrived with technicians and, and, and support from Germany, from other places, this was really extremely important, not only for the knowledge they gave us, but also to show to our government that uh, uh, institution like, uh, that, like the Natural Museum is, is, is an institution that everyone should care about. So that's number one, what I can tell you. Number two, just to give a little bit of the perspective what actually has happened right after that accident. Uh, UNESCO arrived, we had a couple of important and, and, and really uh, very, very, very uh, how we say, um, important meetings. And after that, we were able to secure some funds from the building, uh, from the education minister of Brazil, MEC. This was still at the time of the government of Temer that issued immediately something around $3 million for the museum to, 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 to make a couple of different projects. That there were three main projects. Number one was to, uh, to secure the building so it, it will not completely collapse. Number two, uh, was to provide UNESCO with roughly around one point whatever million dollars to make a project for the restructuring of the museum, particularly of, of the internal part of the museum, and also one, one million reais, it's roughly around 300,000, at that time it was around 200,000, 300,000 dollars. So a project for the rebuilding of the facade and also of the of the of the uh, temporary seating could be done, and parallel to that, uh, we got uh, a financial support from Germany that enabled us to, to 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 do the first steps in recovering the collections that were still inside of the palace, and this was very important because as as, as perhaps. All of you know, even when you have a tragedy like that, and ours was really bad. It was, it was, there's not one corner of the palace that was not affected by the fire. But there's a lot of, of material that still can and survive, that, that still can, can be rescued. And so we started that, and it was really without that support, without the international support, particularly in that case from Germany, it would not have been uh, the place where we are right now. So we started rescuing material. And after that, we also managed to secure from the Brazilian government through the Brazilian Congress a total of it's roughly around 12 million uh, dollars, uh, might be a little bit less of it with the change rate now, but the point being is that we got that amount in order to make the first um, intervention to rebuild the academic part of the museum. One aspect that some some uh, people that work with, with cultural institutions and with, with museums, they don't quite get, is that our museum is a little bit different than from most natural history museums worldwide. And I mean, not only from Brazil, but they send from, from almost every country. Because not only we do have specimens, we do have collections that are very important for humanity, we also uh, are linked with university. In other words, we teach new scientists. We, we provide science, we, we, we develop scientific projects, but we also reform, we build the new scientific capacity that in, in, in our case is, is uh, it's not only in Brazil, but also affect other parts from South America. So in, in that case, uh, uh, this, this, this was a very important uh, uh, resource that we got from the Brazilian government through the deputies, to, through the federal deputies of Rio de Janeiro in order to start this process to rebuild the academic part so that the students could have material to, to work at. By the way, Smithsonian Institution helped us with a couple of fellowships, so we were able to get some of our students abroad so they can start new projects. We also got uh, um, from the British Council 
a, a support in order for us to, to discuss the future of the collection, the future of the building, the safety measurements we, we need to take for, for the new collections. But the most important aspect of all of this, the most difficult task of all of this is not money. Our real, our really, our really biggest task, which I have to tell you honestly, sometimes keeps me from sleeping are the collections and, and since, since right from the beginning we, we were claiming not only in Brazil but outside of Brazil that we need international support for the collections and here I really mean donation of original material donation of, of, of true specimens and that is because the natural museum is not only a Brazilian museum, we are a worldwide museum. We have material from Germany, from Portugal, from Spain, from, 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 from Italy, from all around the world, from China and different places. And this material is in greatest part gone. Yes, we've managed to recover a lot. For example, a collection that's very dear to us uh, is, is the Egyptian collection. And we managed to save a lot of material. Of course, the, the uh, the, the, the all material that has to do with soft tissue, with soft parts, it's gone. But uh, bones and, and, and artifact we managed to, to save, which now needs to be restored, which is another problem of, 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 of all of this, what I'm telling you. But my basic point is that, and, and what I'm, we are really focusing right now, is to show to the international community that without their help, and here I don't mean necessarily funds, but essentially with donation of original specimen, will not be able to recover the museum. But there's something else I, I'd like to point out, and I always stress it, I've said, I've said this numerous times. We in Brazil need to preserve that new material. And the only way we're gonna deserve it is to rebuild a palace with the best of the conditions for safety, for people in here, I mean technicians and visitors, and for the new item, for the new collections. And we, we are actually having quite some success in that, that uh, there was a recent letter that was, it's an open letter that was, was put out by 26 German institutions where they recognized the necessity of rebuilding the museum. They also recognized the problems, inherent problems with that, but they also explicitly mentioned that, that there should be, uh, uh, well, uh, whenever possible, also consideration from different institutions for the donation of original material. And, and that's really something we are aiming at. And in that, in that point, we just got this wonderful news from the Universal Museum Ioannium from, from Graz in Austria, and they, they donated us uh, uh, almost 200 original specimens from Indian tribes that they had in their collection. So this kind of support we need. We also have some, some smaller collections that are coming in, that there's a very nice collection of African material from a private uh, a person that wants to need it to a museum and, and so on and so forth. So this is really something which we're really aiming at, is to receive original material to rebuild our collection. And in, in that sense, I, I hope that um, webinars like this one could, could kind of, of help uh, in that direction. I also want to point out that we had planned, we still hope to be able to, to manage to have that, an international meeting discussing not only cash, uh, questions regarding collection, but also about the future of the museum. Originally, this, this meeting was scheduled from October 5th to October 8th in Rio de Janeiro, which uh, is a little, is, is a little bit a, a, a month uh, uh, later after the, the after the second year of the fire uh, of the museum. So we hope to, we still hope to, to be able to organize that meeting and to have as many participants as, as possible, not only from Brazil but also from outside of Brazil. So that that's one 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 aspect that that's one project we're dealing. But there's another very good. Uh, news for, for, our, for our work in rebuilding the museum, and that came from the Valley Foundation. Very recently, on March 3rd, Valley Foundation, UNESCO, and our university, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, signed a protocol of a new uh, organization system of the project that we call Museo Nacional Vive, the National Museum Lives. And that uh, the idea is to have different committees. We will have an executive committee, 
which is composed of seven members, one from two members from the uh, two members from the university, one member from the museum, uh, another two members from the Valley Foundation, one member from UNESCO, and also one that's been chosen from the civil society. Uh, and then we have another committee, which we are calling the institutional committee. And here we hope to have a lot of international uh, support with different uh, international organizations taking part of that, com of that committee. And this is essential to, to show transparency that everyone can see what we are doing and also advise us to, uh, in all this work uh, uh, regarding the rebuilding of the museum. Then there's something that I think should be really stressed. We have now, we did not want that, to be very honest with you, but we now have an opportunity, an opportunity for international collaboration to rebuild a museum, a natural history museum, anthropological museum, in a way that can become kind of a model for South America. And for that reason, we really would like the support of everyone. I have several other aspects I could, I could point out, but I think those are the main ones, and I think we will have time for some questions so I can go deep in, in any other subject that you would like to take. Thank you very much, doc Dr. Kellner. So I uh, ask Lindsay to, to join, uh, and could you give us a little presentation of uh, yourself and then uh, discuss your, your case with us? Of course. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to fellow presenters. It's been really interesting to put um, what I'm about to discuss into context because it's very much the context I've been thinking about um, really this whole time since last year when the fire at Notre Dame of Paris broke out. So I'll tell you my name is Lindsay Cook and I'm a uh, visiting assistant professor at Vassar College where I teach medieval art and architecture. So I'm primarily interested in Notre Dame of Paris and um, as a medieval monument. And on the other hand, especially since last year, um, I've become much more sort of engaged and involved with the ongoing sort of preservation um, of the cathedral, especially after the fire that took place last year. Um, so I think I, I should just start by talking about the building itself and what occurred in April of last year to, to think about what maybe can be learned from this. Um, because of course, ending up sort of as front page news is one thing, but it doesn't actually necessarily um, help ultimately. So I think for, especially for the professionals here, it might be useful to think about what, what can we learn from this, um, this experience, this disaster. So I would say to be sure, there were many links in the chain of communication the night of the fire on April 15th, 2019 that uh, broke down. And this is definitely something to learn from. So it's, it was clear that at least 30 minutes elapsed from the time that an alarm went off. Um, as you would imagine, there were many sensors in the cathedral. And that basically that sign was misinterpreted by the person who first saw it. Um, and unlike what you might expect, this didn't initially sort of lead to um, the fire response immediately taking place right at that time. And I think this is something that really can be learned from and for your institutions, um, of anyone who's listening, the idea that even if it's just in an abundance of caution that you're having the authorities appear on the site, it should happen. Because I think really, um, by all accounts, if the firefight had begun half an hour sooner, we would have been having a completely different conversation the next day. Um, so that's really, really unfortunate. Uh, that said, once the authorities actually did arrive and were called, the actual response itself was, I think, very sort of intelligently um, um, completed and effective. And so that especially if, if anyone saw the New York Times piece from last summer, I think it, it explained this the best in layman's terms, that essentially what was focused on was the North Tower of the Western Frontispiece. So there's a, a great wooden belfry there. And that was where they realized that um, if the fire were to continue and sort of seize that whole belfry, the bells inside would have become projectiles and we would have been in an even more sort of disastrous um, outcome at the end of the day. So at that point, the entire roof structure had started to go and they realized they, the firefighters had realized they had to kind of give that up, uh, that there was going to be no saving that part of the building. Um, and I think for me, what's sort of really striking about Notre Dame as a case study specifically, and may relate to museums or may not, I'm not exactly sure, is the fact that we're dealing with both uh, immovable cultural heritage, so the building itself and the fact that we have a historic building that is 
you know, perhaps the most important element here um, at, at the root of it, um, and lots and lots of immovable uh, or movable cultural heritage as well. So all of the artifacts that were inside, the altarpieces, etc. And so I would say particularly impressive was the response when it came to movable cultural heritage. Um, and so the artifacts that were removed by a specialized fire brigade who were trained essentially if the Louvre were to have a fire, it's the same uh, team that would, would respond. And so as you can imagine, they were really um, expert at handling, ha handling that. And really, I mean, altarpieces, reliquaries, as we heard, right, the relics even inside of like passion relics that will be sh uh, displayed tomorrow during um, Holy Week services. Are, were recovered, and it was sort of astonishing to see that even down to you know carpets from the choir were able to be re recovered. Part of the reason that was possible was because of the sort of unique structure of Notre Dame or other Gothic cathedrals, in the sense that the roof structure, the wood and the lead that did melt or disintegrate or sort of burn up, was independent from the structural system, the stone structure underneath. Um, and so this is actually something really important to keep in mind in this case, and it may not be true of your institution. So something really to keep in mind that a fire of this magnitude might have caused a much bigger problem um, in a building that was not built that way. Um, so at this point, it might be helpful to show the first slide that I had, Casey. And I just wanted to think um, through a few of the different um, agents of deterioration in this case, in this event. And I was really impressed by the uh, July 2019 webinar uh, that AAMC put together. And so I, I sort of thought about this a little bit in those terms. And so the most obvious agent of deterioration here in this uh, disaster was, of course, the fire itself. So you see it here. Once the roof structure is almost entirely uh, gone, you see just a, a small element of it left standing. And most of what you're, you're seeing here, it's as the fire is really uh, uh, dwindling at this point a little bit, but also you'll notice that the metallic scaffolding that had been put in place pretty recently to work on the spire, which now at this point in this image you're seeing here had already, um, had already fallen down, um, that metallic scaffolding sort of has a really important role to play uh, today in the sort of conservation efforts and stabilization efforts because it's a really, it's a big hazard um, at this point for the stability of the building. Um, so the high temperatures in particular were a big part of the problem with the fire here because the stone building, um, the risk is that the fire itself at the high temperatures that it managed to reach would actually start to weaken the stone and would ultimately actually turn it back into lime, essentially. So you have working with this sort of soft limestone that is a, a cause for concern. Um, but the even bigger uh, problem, sort of going back to this question of structure and the roof structure versus the stone structure underneath, is in the next slide. So Casey, could you proceed to the next? And that is to say the physical force of the spire actually breaking through um, those stone vaults down below. So um, if, if this had not happened, we would have really not had as much concern for the interior of the structure at all. But what you're seeing right now, we're sort of looking through, this is not, nothing you should ever be able to see in a Gothic building, right? So we're basically standing on top, of, the vantage point is standing on top of the vaults. Um, and so looking down and you're able to see through the vaults, the crossing vault is completely missing at this point. Um, and you, you see, of course, also the, um, that was caused by this falling of the spire into the, the center of the building. So this has caused um, the instability of the building that is currently a, a really great cause for concern. Um, the other element, of course, in fighting the fire that was introduced was water. And so this too, the, the combination of heat and water at the same time is again cause for concern in terms of the stability of the, the supporting piers that are down below in the crossing. Um, and so this is really uh, continues to be worrisome and the, the structure is still being monitored. And then the last sort of agent of deterioration or cause for concern in this disaster, um, I would say, or is, is the lead um, that, that did melt at the very beginning and was also released into the air. And there was a lead coating to the entire roof structure, the spire as well. And um, especially by last summer, it became very clear that this was a problem um, and that the lead levels were very high. And it also changed. There needed to be not only lead remediation, but also um, a sort of pause and a, a complete change in protocol for handling the site, um, especially last summer. And it even led to a, a brief halt um, at, the, at the site itself. I would see that, I think we can take down the slides at this point, that's all right. Um, the major takeaway for me beyond um, the questions of communication, I think the biggest one for me has to do with documentation. Um, and 
I think that both analog and digital tools um, are needed more than ever um, to make sure that you have a collection to save. Um, and in the case of Notre Dame, we're lucky that it, it didn't, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, um, and yet it was pretty bad. And so having um, records of what had been there before um, was really, really important. And I think this is something to keep in mind for collections is that um, very often, um, I think digitization efforts in particular, the idea of having a collection backed up is something that might sound like either a gimmick sort of related to social media, or it may be seen as just something that a, a, um, an institution with more limited resources can't prioritize or sh shouldn't be prioritizing. And I think to the contrary, um, if it something, you know, God forbid happens, to um, either limit access to the collection as we're seeing right now during in the sort of COVID crisis. Um, of course, your digital collection essentially becomes a collection and becomes the lifeline uh, to the collection for the general public as well as for, of course, staff. Um, so I think this is the kind of urgent, urgent need that I'm noticing, especially now um, in light of COVID. Luckily, in the case of Notre Dame of Paris, the building was extremely well documented, not only um, I mean, since the beginning of the history of photography, of course, famously, I mean, it's, it's been documented. Um, and more recently, so in the last 10 years or so, so, there's also been a push to create a series of three-dimensional laser scans as well of the building. So there are both complete laser scans of the entire structure, which are a little bit less dense and older. So there was one done in 2010, for instance. Um, and then much denser scans of places that are now completely gone. So for instance, you can travel through a laser scan from 2014 that demonstrates the entire roof structure, all of the timber framework that is now completely, I mean, we have fragments of them and that of course has been documented and may even be used in the, in the restoration, but it's something that we don't currently have um, on site. And so it's, it's really a, a tremendous resource to have some of those, um, some of those documents. The question of how useful they'll be in the reconstruction is sort of remains up for debate. And luckily, there's a lot of analog records actually as well. So the um, studies that had been done prior to the restoration project, which was underway already before the fire, um, led the architect, the chief architect, to conduct many architectural studies. And so there's just tons of documentation in this case. And so I would say if you're uh, managing a collection, think about this. Um, from this perspective, what if something this um, awful were to happen to your collection? What could you possibly do to make sure that you have backed up on a in a site that is not related to the site that could potentially burn down? Um, having it kind of in the cloud, as it were, is a really, really important um, essential service that you need to provide um, to make sure that you're maintaining the collection. So I think that's the those are the big takeaways that I wanted to present. If you want to shift to Q and A. Oh, thank you everyone for, for your uh, case studies and, and talks. And I uh, would like to begin with a question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do one question for each of you and then I'll uh, address the, the, the question from, from the audience. And um, first for um, Corrine, um, I, I had no, I, I haven't thought about what you, you explain. Uh, at first in your in your talk that you were you were dealing with the issue of uh, recovery of, of, of a damaged um, museum and uh, a collection but also with a war crime and so um, how documentation on the state of that building and the and the extent of the damage also was important for or is important for um, uh, seeking uh, justice and responsibility for what had happened uh, there. So I would like to to ask you um, a little bit about how uh, how uh, the whole project uh, deals with issues of law protection for the ones involved in this and how this documentation is being served now for um, you know for addressing and asking you know for reparation and justice of what happened um, well the the answer to that is that the um, Iraqi government and colleagues have have all the documentation and as they move forward in their processes to seek justice 
for all kinds of crimes against civilians and, and the cultural heritage, they will have the access to all that, all that material to work with um, uh, attorneys and um, how, however they see fit to move ahead in that process. And that's the thing that we had to remember is it's, it's so important to work with the um, survivors of these disasters to, to make sure that they get the help they need in doing that proper documentation so that they have it. Because sometimes these criminal tribunals can happen years and years after the fact. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that the evidence can stand on its own. And that's one of the really valuable things that we learned how to do. And what about protection uh, for you who worked uh, legal protection, I mean, for you who work and are collecting those data and those documents for for serving? Um, um, well, I don't know. Do we need legal protection? <laughs> I don't feel like we do. Um, I, I feel like we used um, the best practices that we learned through law enforcement and that we're following um, best practices on making sure that we share the material with our colleagues and it may be that in the future some of us would be called upon to discuss it in court um etc but that we're i think a little ways off from that process but okay i think this is something we all have to be prepared to do if we're mm -hmm. being advocates for cultural heritage in these disaster situations but you will have advice uh, for doing that, right? Sure, of course. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Alexander, I, um, uh, some might be uh, surprised uh, by your uh, decision of rebuilding collections while you are also rescuing and assessing the damage uh, that happened in the museum. Uh, and I, I do understand that your, um, your uh, main, uh, you know, concern is that uh, your museum is also a research museum, a university museum. So the uh, research must go on and, you know, uh, you have to, to, to train and uh, be aware that you have a responsibility on um, in relation to the scientific community and uh, the students you have in the museum. So um, I think it's a bold and, and of course, um, hard decision. Uh, and I would like to ask what I, are the kind of um, protocols or, um, or requirements that um, potential donators are asking for you and what can you provide for uh, them to secure that uh, these collections that are, are coming to the museum now uh, will be properly uh, storage and care uh, throughout uh, the recovery of the building and the, you know, the reestablishment of the activities. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Fernanda. I think that, that that's uh, definitely raised a couple of interesting points. And the main one is uh, regarding how, how to actually how we have all of this. Uh, our, first, our first purpose was to make people aware. I remember I had this very interesting conversation with a colleague of mine and he essentially said, I will send you money. And I said, I want a collection. And he said, I will send you money. And I said, I want a collection. So in other words, we all know how difficult it's going to be to get original material. We know that. So this is why I wanted to start doing that right from the beginning. So how, how are we going to go about it? Because also my point is that we not necessar necessarily need to rebuild exactly what we had. Because first of all, most of our specimens are unique specimens. We're not going to have it anyway. But our point is more or less is to, to, to make uh, other, other museums aware that we have an opportunity here. I give an example. Uh, every museum, every museum, particularly in, in our case, natural history museums and anthropological material, has, has thousands, if not millions, of specimens that are essentially sitting in our basement. We had it the same. We, we had the same. So the point is 
what is it better to have it sitting in your basement or being part of an, an exhibition? And here, I mean, uh, uh, our idea is to, to, to make uh, people feel com comfortable in donating what they have. And it's not essential to say, just give me something. He's saying, make a list of what you could consider donating. And with that list, we, we then will discuss what would be appropriate for a new exhibit. We're already working on, we, we have a lot of homework to do, but we already did most of it. We have already, we know exactly what we want in, in, in general topics. We want to talk about biodiversity in South America, for example. This, this, is, this is a wonderful topic, and here we, we already have very good chances of getting material from other museums in Brazil and also from other parts of South America. We know that. But do we, want, do we only uh, like to show the biomes we have here, or would we like to make comparisons? And here's where all the material comes in, you know. So, so th this is the idea, is, is to make people aware about the necessity, but also for them saying essentially, this, this is what you would have, and now we then discuss which would be appropriate or not. Now, you ask about guarantees. The, the, actually, you, you, uh, it's kind of funny, because there is a certain, there is a certain, um, how we say, a certain concern that we, I think we all have to, 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 to learn with what happened in the museum. Look, it does, it's not only enough to secure your building, that you have everything in place, which we didn't, by the way, but it's not only enough that. We also need to have the surroundings secure. secure. Why? Because one of the biggest issues and problems we had in, in the fire of, of, of the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro was because there was no water. There was no water in, in the hydrants. I, I always I keep remembering the, when, I, when I see different action that was done, that, that were done by Notre Dame. You know, the firefighters going in, you know, and rescue material and, 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 and this kind of thing. They didn't have the water. So even if with everything in place, we wouldn't have prevented. So that's, that's another take home lessons. You need, it, you, you, you cannot say, okay, I, I, I'll do it alone. No, you have to have the community around you involved. So you, you have to have the, 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 the state Rio de Janeiro, the government of stuff of the Rio de Janeiro, and also the federal state. So that, that's another thing, which I think is a take home lessons. And regarding the collection, number one is to make people aware. And right from the beginning, that's, that's what we did. So consider. And, and, and number two is whenever we'll have then actual, for example, there was, there was I think I can say that there was one condition that, that the Universal Museum Yonim said to us, we will give her that material. But we would, they didn't put it as a condition, but it was a condition. But we would like you to tell the indigenous tribes that you had it. In other words, we would like you to work with them. The good part of that and, 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 uh, was that we were already doing that, even before the fire. And, and uh, very quickly, right after the fire, the several represent leaders of those indigenous tribes, they came to us and said, we are going to produce for you. We want to be represented in that museum. And the only reason why they did that is because we're already working with them. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kellner and uh, Lindsay. Uh, for you, I uh, was thinking about two uh, things that, um, you know, I think ha are particular to uh, the case of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. One is that you're um, more than other institutions and like museums that we're uh, uh, talking about here. Uh, uh, Notre Dame is a, like a, a workshop uh, place mm -hmm. and also a tourist, uh, you know, a destination. Mm -hmm. So how um how do you see this specific uh you know interest of of the the site of the building and of uh what is inside uh impacts uh the way uh it's going to be uh well it's being addressed uh the fire is being addressed and how um is there any 
because uh, we know of like dealing with uh, objects objects of worship like sculptures or um, altar pieces or uh, that are many for many communities for many groups the fact that uh, those objects might have suffered uh, a fire or um, or a damage are um, are uh, you know um, what make them uh, also uh, relics and 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 um, you know. Uh, sacred objects and uh, many I remember now a study by Dr. Uh, Gabriela Seracusano uh, in uh, Argentina that she uh, was uh, working on a conservation of a piece that was damaged by by touch and uh, a, a saint and a sculpture of a saint that was damaged by touch and she had to um, get to like a common ground with the community who worship that uh, object on whether restore it to its full, uh, you know, uh, integrity or letting the 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 marks and the and the you know the uh, testimonies of the damage to still exist because it was important for those who consider that object not an object not not object sure. but a, a you know a, a sacred uh, object sort of powerful token yeah I, I think it's played out interesting because you might I mean are you asking about the way that the building will be restored is that part of what you're getting at as well uh, also uh, the uh, how the process of restoring or the process of uh, you know uh, solve, uh, you know in, in making uh, uh, it safe now uh, deals with the issue of tourism and worship. Yes, so I think, I mean, there are so many stakeholders involved in this, and I think that's what you're getting at. And it's true that I would say, if anything, the Catholic Church has had a kind of outsized role um, in this whole process. And certainly it's seen now, I mean, there, at, at the very beginning, the president suggested, Macron suggested that by 2024, the cathedral would be reconstructed, it would be, you know, good as new, whether that's a contemporary building or just an identical reconstruction of the way it was before. Um, and slowly, bit by bit, it's become clear that by now it seems that 2024 is now the deadline for reopening, basically giving back the cathedral to the church so that they can hold regular services. There have been some uh, services, there will be apparently tomorrow for Good Friday, there will be a Good Friday service with just a small group of people in the cathedral. So that has been um, I, I think especially for American, American scholars who sometimes tend to forget just how um, deep um, the sort of Catholic ties run in France. This was a, a really strong reminder, I think, for those of us who don't, who aren't, um, um, aren't French and, and concerned with this problem. Um, and so that's been a, a real sort of cause for concern. Another place where that sort of cropped up was certainly in the recovery of the crown of thorns. So I think the fact that that managed to make it into so many, I mean, there was lots and lots of coverage of that uh, incident. And it, that was another moment that sort of surprised me. And it was a reminder too that yes, this is still a living cathedral just as much as, as it is a, a tourist destination. On the other hand, I think the main, the, the reason that there was such a sort of international um, response, sort of, and positive and negative, I should also add, um, had to do with the, the fact that it's a central key tourist site. Um, and so I think it's impossible to, to untangle those two things and they're really working in tandem. And if anything, the tourist, that side of things is going to end up helping the, the church in a sort of surprising way potentially. But there are just many stakeholders in, on top of the sort of tourist component and the, um, the church itself. You also have the, the governmental response, which has been a little bit separated in some ways in terms of what they plan to do or hope to do in the future from the architect who's in charge. Um, and this is a really unusual situation where there's been a lot of oversight from the president and um, his deputies, which you don't often see in other sites of cultural heritage in France. Sorry, <laughs> I might start with the questions by the by the audience, and then I will ask you uh, each one to, if you like, to uh, present a question for your colleagues. And uh, the first question we have it is uh, it's a comment by uh, 
someone in the audience that uh, remained anonymous. Uh, and the person says, I understand the French fire uh, department has a staff member that made on-site watercolors documenting the structure of Notre Dame as it was burning. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the person is asking you, Lindsay, if you know what the purpose of this uh, is or was, and what is the impact of those watercolors on the reconstruction? So that's, that was, I remember those watercolors because I, they were first and foremost really beautiful, actually, and the idea that the fire department, that, that is someone's job, right, in the, in the French fire brigade was to do that very um, thing. And so what they were essentially showing was things like I was describing, so that meant pointing out the belfry and thinking about the different materials that were used uh, throughout the building. And so I think that was crucial for the identifying uh, points of weakness, what, at what point they were able to sort of let the roof go because they realized also that it was completely independent from the stone structure underneath. And uh, also realizing sort of the importance of the belfry on the north side as it caught fire because it did, it did start to catch and that's where they had to focus their efforts so that it didn't uh, transfer to the other tower and potentially um, uh, allow bells also to fall. So I think as far as I know, that was the reason it was used. It was very much sort of tactical on site. Um, and then ultimately it became a kind of human interest story as well um, as it was shared. And I hope those are, are preserved actually because it's another important um, uh, document. As far as whether that will have an impact on the reconstruction, I'm really not so sure about that because there are so many other, um, there were lasers even installed on the building. I think there's, in terms of the structural stability, those hand drawings are, are less likely to have a role to play. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, maybe uh, you have a question for, for one of our colleagues. Uh, anyone of you think of a, a question? Yeah, I, I have a question to, to my colleagues. Uh, actually, I have two questions. One is a provocative one. The other one is not so provocative. The first one that goes on for, for the panelists, uh, which, which do you think, uh, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge that you have in, in, in the work you're doing or on the work that you're building uh, at the, the sites that you mentioned? And the second question is, and that goes also for you, Fernanda, what would you do if you would be the director of the largest scientific institution of Brazil that caught fire? Karim? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll take the, um, what's my biggest problem, because <laughs> I probably can answer that, and I don't know if I can answer how tough a job you have, Dr. Kilmer. Um, I, I think our, our big, it's a big problem, and it's a big goal, um, listening to Dr. Cook talking about how great France's um, emergency response for cultural heritage is, and how integrated it is into the larger disaster response framework of France is a fantastic model, I think, in, in so many ways. And not everybody has that um, possibility in their country. And, and so always our biggest challenge is to try to constantly be the advocate for having cultural heritage integrated into the larger disaster risk management framework in all the countries where we work and, in, and including the US can always use more work on that as well. Lindsay? Um, I would say, I mentioned all these stakeholders and I think that's the biggest, um, the biggest challenge is understanding who's in charge of what and who is making a decision. Um, and it seems that even people who used to think they could make decisions all of a sudden have um, sort of been relieved of that power all of a sudden. Um, and so then also for those of us who are sort of more um, observers who are, of course, you know, deeply involved with the building in other ways, like myself as a historian, um, understanding who you need to find answers, you know, who you need to go to in order to find answers about what's, what's the current status. Um, so I think it would be really wonderful if there were more of a kind of clearinghouse for a lot of this information, because it certainly doesn't exist at the, at the present moment. Do you want to? answer uh, Dr. Dr. Kellner's uh, provocation about being the director of the National Museum? I think we'll all pass at the very least. Okay. 
Oh yeah, Dr. Kono, I think we all are, you know, uh, in solidarity with you and we wouldn't like to be in your place and I think you're doing a great job on, uh, you know, uh, uh, asking for international support for uh, rebuilding the museum and also uh, taking care of your uh, students and uh, researchers that are still doing the job despite of this big loss and tragedy that uh, they, they, they are living. And um, just for a last question, because we are about to finish our time, I would like to ask you all um, how this current situation, the pandemic situation, um, is making you uh, think of new aspects of your um, practice and uh, work and how, um, of course, we all know that all of you are experiencing, uh, uh, you know, the, the interruption of uh, your plans and your, and your um, you know, activities and due to this, uh, like, more uh, urgent emergency. And um, Corinne already addressed that in her speech that, uh, because we're now uh, going through this pandemic, we cannot uh, forget uh, that we, we can have fires and hurricanes and you know, conflict and everything that might come together with this uh, current situation. And I would like to uh, ask you to think the other way back, like how uh, this uh, specific uh, situation we uh, are facing is, uh, uh, teaching you um, how to address uh, the the questions that you you were you know dedicated to. Um, I think now is a really good time to because we're working from home often, but we have these great things like Zoom where we can still be in touch with our colleagues. It's a good time to start you know, you're, you're always revising your emergency plan and we're thinking about what we can do remotely. I've seen some fantastic examples of curators still using their collections in innovative ways online, still getting virtual tours, things like that, where, where because they have good documentation of their collections, they're able to do things like that. Um, but it's not too early to be keeping track of lessons learned um, we've seen some um, museum thefts happen, thinking about security, thinking about how we can um, make sure that we're doing all we can to, you know, connecting with first responders still. I know they're very busy, but, you know, as, as part of the community, talking to, you know, the normal people that you keep in your network, your insurance company, et cetera, um, those are all things that we can do. And then thinking about this, for our emergency plan going forward. One other thing I was thinking that is sort of, it's completely unrelated to my own case study, although if this had, if the fire at Notre Dame had happened, or COVID-19 had happened at the, let's say, 850th anniversary, which was fed Notre Dame of Paris very recently. Um, I've seen, I, I feel like it's, it's, uh, there's a particular trend to have a lot of exhibitions that coincide with anniversaries, either of births or of deaths. And what that I think is having, I mean, there's a sort of the underlying result of this is that, for instance, a lot of the Raphael shows, which had recently opened, um, is anyone ever going to get to see them? So I think maybe a reconsideration of that curatorial strategy um, might be in order in, in this particular moment if it happened for some extraordinary circumstance that for a few months everything shuts down. Um, it's not necessarily, then you might miss the opportunity to see some of those works. Yeah, one way or another, we were already thinking about new ways uh, how to address what a society expects from a museum. I mean, this is not an accentuated because of, of, of this virus, because actually, let's be honest, who thought that would happen? I mean, the, those things you read, you read in, in novels, you see in movies, but actually to live it. But it, this really has to, to, to put us to thinking about different ways, and, and, and I think uh, Corinne pointed it out, different ways of, of, of the curators showing their material and, and, and showing uh, uh, 
giving to the public what they want. And I think that that's definitely one thing we have to, to work on and, and to, to think about. How can we now, with this kind of situation, because it may not be the only one that might happen in the next decade or so, so how can we address situations like this in order to make museums relevant, to make our specimen or material or, or, or cultural items relevant for the society? Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Palmer. And I, uh, as we are approaching uh, the end of this webinar, I would like again to thank you all for being uh, with us. Uh, thank you, the participants. Thank you, the uh, uh, our panelists, Kareen, Lindsay, and uh, Alexander, for being uh, here today uh, with us. And for we know everyone is. Uh, you know, busy and uh, dealing with the the, uh, the current uh, situation we are living in. And I hope everyone stay safe at home and um, that you, uh, we can go through this together uh, with safety and health. And I uh, would like to remind everyone that this session has been recorded and it will be added to uh, AMC's archive and make avail available for all of the participants within a week. And uh, we are looking forward to see you at the next webinar. And uh, I would like to invite you to go to archivators.org uh, website to see uh, what us and the upcoming, uh, you know, uh, program of webinars and also uh, there you can have access to the previous uh, webinars to, through the archive. So thank you everyone, stay safe and I'll see you soon. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye.